Well, welcome to everyone. I'm Bob Orr, and it's my pleasure today to interview North Carolina Court of Appeals Judge Lucy Inman, a candidate for the North Carolina Supreme Court. Uh, and we're delighted that everyone's tuned in to WPVM 103.7 in the heart of downtown Asheville. Judge Inman, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, and thank you for doing these candidate forums. Well, we know they're important to get the, get the word out uh, to voters around the state. And I want to begin by just asking you some basic biographical questions. Tell the listeners a little bit about Judge Lucien. Sure. Well, I grew up in Raleigh. My parents were both writers. My father was a newspaper photographer, then a reporter, then an editor. Um, my mother stayed home with me and my three brothers until we were all in school, and then she went back to school herself. And I grew up in Raleigh, went to great public schools, went to NC State University for college and got a degree in English. And my first job out of uh, college was working as a newspaper reporter. Well, Where so I, there in Raleigh or at uh, at another newspaper? In, in Raleigh for yeah. the Raleigh Times newspaper. Which was the afternoon paper in, in the old days, right? It was the afternoon paper, and our competitor for news was the News and Observer. <laughs> Which was the so morning was newspaper. All, <laughs> that's right. So yeah. it was our always our goal, if we could scoop the News and Observer um, and other media, that was our goal. Well, th this is an off-the-wall question, but that's the benefit of these interviews. So what was the biggest story you covered during your, your days as a reporter? Well, that's a good, that's a good question. Um, I covered crimes and emergencies, yeah. um, which would include, um, you know, uh, and, and crimes and emergencies which intersected with courts. I once covered a case in which the Wake County District Attorney's Office handed down sealed indictments against a man who um, was accused of sexually abusing his daughters. The day those indictments were handed down, the man went back to the home, even though there was a protective order, I believe, yeah. and killed his, his daughters and his wife and started to set the, uh, the house on fire and accidentally also caught himself on fire. So this has got all the components of news for television and newspaper and, and everything. Right. And um, I covered that, that crime scene. And then when that case went to trial, um, I also covered the trial. And to me, the trials that I covered were the biggest stories because the dust had settled and you had a little bit more time to think about what really had happened and what the consequences were going to be. So uh, as an English major at NC State and a journalist uh, in your first part of your career, was it covering the court cases that uh, inspired you to go to law school or was that something you'd been thinking about? I had no notion that I would want to go to law school. I really didn't know what I wanted to do. One of my English professors told me that I seemed to ask a lot of questions and that I would make a good journalist. I decided to take that as a compliment. And um, it was really, I had been a reporter for about three years when I realized, I think I'd like to do something beyond stay at the Raleigh Times for the rest of my life. And um, I saw so many amazing lawyers and judges and just people in the court, in the courts. I thought, I think I'd like to do that and not just write about it. So that's Did, really what inspired me. Were you thinking about being a practicing lawyer, or did you actually see the judiciary somewhere in your future? I did not, I did not see the judiciary in my future. I certainly had the benefit of the judges whose courtrooms I covered um, were, were very accommodating to the press in the sense that if they could trust a reporter, if they could trust a reporter to report what's happening in open court, they could say, let me tell you about the background of what procedurally is happening here. Um, and so they were really good teachers. 
but the lawyers were the people, as you know, in court, the lawyers get most of the airtime. <laughs> and, and seeing the lawyers on opposite sides of cases, uh, making their case to the jury was, was really what to me was like, wow, that, that person is telling the story and they're marshalling the evidence to persuade this jury. Um, I, I didn't, that it, nobody in my family had been a lawyer or a judge. So I really didn't know. The beauty about having been a newspaper reporter before I go into law school was I thought, you know, whatever kind of lawyer I am, I'm going to be able to make as good a living as I am as a newspaper reporter. <laughs> so. and, and yeah, that's turned out to be a good, a good prediction uh, for sure. Well, well, so so how many years were you a reporter? Let's see, three and a half years. And then you went to UNC Law School. I went to UNC Law School um, way over in Chapel Hill. So not <laughs> venturing too far, too far from home. That he's and, pulled for the Wolfpack or do you pull for the Tar Heels? Well, you know. And that's tough to ask a candidate that, right? You're going to. No, no, yeah. that's okay. That's okay. When they're playing other teams, that's an easy question. Yeah. When they're playing other teams, that's an easy question. I'm not, I was not a huge sports fan in college. Um, I would watch the last five minutes of the NC State games. And I graduated in 1984. So I was there for the NCAA championship. But, but. In basketball, um, in basketball yeah. Basketball, yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. yes, in, in, in basketball. But anyway, I went to Chapel Hill. I lived out in a cabin that was built by the Army Corps of Engineers when they were mm -hmm. building Jordan Lake. And I continued to work part time as a reporter, then for the News and Observer, and um, loved law school. It was I was not not too many of my classmates had taken a break between college and law school, and I was really glad that I had and got to be good friends with some other folks who had had a little bit of prior work experience. So uh, three years in Chapel Hill at law school and. Am I right? You headed to California? Not right away. Not right away. All right. Not right away. Um, not right away. When I was in law school, I clerked in the summers for some lawyers who are still uh, some of my greatest heroes, Wade and Roger Smith, Liz Cunningham, Don Beskin, mm -hmm. um, Dave Rudolph, uh, Tom Maher. And I thought I was going to work for one of those law firms after law school. But Chief Justice Exum at the Supreme Court was interested in hiring me to be his clerk. And I was really interested in something that could be a bridge between law school and practice. And so I clerked for him for two years and assumed that I was going to practice law in the area with some of these lawyers who had mentored me. But I fell in love with a newspaper reporter and he was going to graduate school in California and I knew it was true love when I agreed to take a second state bar and move there with them. <laughs> yeah, that that is a, above and beyond. And I hope Billy's been paying that back for for years. Oh, he has. He has. He has. Right, we're, yeah, he we're has. referencing Billy Warden, uh, Judge Inman's husband, who is a noted, no longer a reporter, but a communications czar who appears on uh, television regularly commenting on on politics but we'll we'll get into whether billy's advising you on the campaign or not but uh, <laughs> so so you headed to california you had to take another bar and you practiced out there for a while i practiced out there for eight years and i practiced for I practiced civil litigation for eight years um a lot of commercial litigation and in Los Angeles, a lot of business litigation is in the entertainment business. Mm -hmm. So that was pretty interesting. A lot of First Amendment work. Um, and I had my first jury trial defending a father, a grieving father, who had the audacity to name his son's drug dealer on national TV and to blame that drug dealer for his son's death by suicide. Mm -hmm. And um, it was a great a great experience. The judge did not agree with me that this was a matter of public concern because of because of cocaine addiction and told us that we would have to prove that this drug dealer really caused the death of this man. But fortunately, 
my client's son had paid for all his cocaine and checks. And we got a, an expert witness to explain to the jury what is called cocaine psychosis and we're fortunate enough to prevail in that trial. So you won your first jury trial. I won my first jury trial. Um, I could not have done it without the mentoring and teaching and support of senior lawyers in my law firm. Well, and so after eight years, uh, was it you deciding it was time to head back to North Carolina or Billy or a joint decision? Uh, what brought you home? Well, uh, what brought us home was we had a two-year-old and then we learned we had a second child on the way. And Los Angeles was a really exciting place to, to practice law. Uh, Billy was working as a television producer and journalist, uh, but I could not see how I was going to work fewer hours and um, also afford to send kids to preschool in a town, which to me from North Carolina, applying to preschool was like applying to college. Right. And um, I prevailed upon Billy to return to North Carolina where our parents are and he agreed to do it. And it was a mutual decision. But just as it was a, a leap of love for me to move to California with him, um, it was a little bit like asking an Eskimo to move back to Florida when I got him to move back here. But he he did it. And I'm really glad that we did. And so while having two children, did you uh, go back into practicing law part time, full time? I went back. Well, we called it part time. Right. Part time in the practice of law was at first it was working just five days a week and then I went down and then I went down to four days a week yeah. and I practiced I completely changed my practice and I worked in a small firm with Liz Cunningham who was a lawyer I had worked with when during law school and um, she was I could not have done it without her accommodating my schedule and making it possible for me to do that but my kids were welcome in the office when well-behaved and learned that they had to be quiet and draw pictures. When my son was about four years old, he drew a picture of a creature with spikes all over its body, every surface. I mean, the eyelashes, the tail. And I said, Will, what do you call that creature? And he said, a litigator. <laughs> and that was, that was a wake-up call to me that I had been doing battle. And that's the nature of our adversarial system. But um, that was that was soon followed by my decision that I wanted to seek a seat in the um, in the Superior Court. And so tell us how that came about. Well, first, I'll say there's nothing like wanted to, wanting to be appointed or elected as a judge to make you a better lawyer. And um, one of my law school classmates, Deborah Ross, uh, suggested that I put my hat in the ring to run for election. And I was not ready to do that. I didn't think my family was ready for me to do that. So I sought to be appointed to a position called a special superior court judge. And that's a handful of superior court judges who are appointed by the governor and they travel around the state as needed. And I applied when Governor Mike Easley was the governor and uh, was not appointed uh, several times. The council was always nice to me. Let me know if someone else has been appointed. Mm -hmm. And um, eventually I was appointed by Governor Bev Perdue in 2010. And so you spent four years, five years as a Superior Court judge? Yes. Yeah. Uh, let's see, 2010. Four and a half years. Yeah, yeah four and, and a half years. And for the benefit of folks listening, uh, what, what were your responsibilities and duties as a Superior Court judge? Well, the Superior Court judges are probably who most people think of when they think of judges that they've seen in television and in movies. Um, Superior Court judges preside over jury trials and the matter and, and preside over hearings and they're matters that are a certain minimum amount of money in dispute, um, felony cr criminal cases, um, some administrative review. And as a special superior court judge, I used to say, have gavel, will travel. 
because instead of being elected to a specific district and sitting in that district for six months at a time, I would go to whatever counties a judge was needed in, whether it was because the judge who was assigned there was sick that week or the judge had a conflict of interest and, and couldn't hear a case. Um, when I would arrive wherever I was going, um, I will say in some of some counties, people weren't used to seeing women superior court judges, and I would be uh, scolded for parking in the judge's parking place. But when I pulled out my robe, they were just as nice as they could be. And I worked with, um, in addition to in the courtroom, out of the courtroom, I worked a lot on writing orders and reviewing cases. And I also work with law enforcement officers. When a law enforcement officer needs to get a search warrant signed, they have to apply to a, to a superior court judge uh, for certain crimes. And so law enforcement officers pretty much knew their way to get to my house. And everyone in my family knew that, you know, mom might have to get up late at night. Um, that's okay, because you, you don't get to pick when law enforcement officers are going to need a judge to review something. So how many counties do you think you uh, held court in over the course of those four and a half years? I think 40. May have been more, but 40 for sure. Well, um, before- Including, I should say, in Buncombe County. Yeah, yeah that's right. And that's, including in Buncombe County, where I once had a trial where one of the lawyers was a former Superior Court judge. Uh, well, the- uh, the courthouse in Buncombe County, I think the spirit courtrooms, one of the coolest, neatest courtrooms in the, in the state. That's where I was sworn in eh, 47 years ago, 48 years ago. Uh, it, it's one of my favorite, favorite courtrooms. Uh, so uh, before we get into the uh, election aspect, let me just ask a couple of more uh, family questions. You have two college age sons. Um, you have uh, a black lab rescue that is now sequestered in the basement so that he won't bark during this, this interview. Uh, yeah, how'd you come about getting that dog? Well, um, I'd say uh, he's a rescue dog, but he rescued us as much as we, we rescued him. And Billy had been promising our kids for years, of course, that we would have a dog. Um, and I had been saying, are we, are we sure we're ready for a dog? Are we sure we're ready for the dog? Yeah. One day we went to go see these dogs at a rescue um, farm. And I said, everybody, we're only going to look. We're only going to meet. But um, Eddie came bounding out of the barn and instantly fell in love with my kids. And um, um, like coming back to North Carolina for Billy, wasn't my idea to get the dog that day, but we did get the dog that day. And, and he's been with us for about 12 years. And we think he was one or two when he came to us. Yeah. We're not really sure, but he's wonderful. So uh, I, I will have to tell you, maybe the single best ad for a judge that I've seen in the state is by a district court judge up in Avery County named Bill Level. And he had a black lab and he ran a picture of, of himself in his black robe and the black lab and the, and the headline was good guys wear black. And, uh, and he talked about what he did and he talked about what his uh, black lab, whose name was bear did. And I, I thought it was the most effective ad uh, that I, I think I'd ever seen. Um, oh, that is, that is, that is great. That is great. <laughs> yeah. So uh, at some point uh, you decided that you were going to jump into a statewide race for the Court of Appeals, and that would have been what year? Oh, eight? Uh, that was in, um, the race was in 2014. Okay. And in, in 2013, um, another Superior Court judge pointed out to me that he thought that a judge on the Court of Appeals, Bob, Mountain Bob Hunter from Marion, mm -hmm. uh, might retire. And I had never thought about running for office before, but I was in a an appointed position and um, only had a, a another couple of years that would be left at that point. And I thought about it. The more I thought about it, the more I thought I'd try it. I'd never run for dog catcher, right. but I did know a lot of folks around the state. 
and these at that time the elections were nonpartisan, which was really attractive to me. I had not I'm a lifelong Democrat, but I had not been very involved with with partisan politics. And I I worked as hard as I could and um my opponent and I had a very uh cordial competition. We each got more than a million votes, and but I uh, ultimately uh, got the greater number of votes and was elected in 2014. So there's a pretty big difference between the responsibilities of a Superior Court judge and a Court of Appeals judge. Tell the listeners uh, uh, about those differences and, and sort of how you took to the responsibilities of the Court of Appeals. Uh, it really it really is very, very different. Um, uh, the late who Bailey, who you might remember, mm -hmm. um, Bob, yeah, yeah. Uh, who was a trial judge, said trial judges are the greatest judges because they make decisions in the heat of the day and appellate judges decide cases in the cool shade of the evening. And in the heat of the day, that means that trial judges have to make rulings immediately on objections during a trial. They have to think on their feet. Appellate judges have more time to hear, to review what's happened in the trial court but also trial judges have to make those decisions on their own. And appellate judges make decisions in groups. At the Court of Appeals, we sit in panels of three. And the most immediate change to me was, well, I get, I get some help from some other judges, but also I'm not the boss anymore. Right, right. I work with two other people. Um, is a lot more reading at the Court of Appeals. We don't see witnesses, we don't see jurors. And one of the things that I did, knowing just knowing my my desire to have structure, was when I started on the Court of Appeals, I got myself a treadmill desk. And Chief Judge Stroud has one as well. Right, right. It's a stand-up desk with a very slow treadmill. Because I decided I didn't want to have to give myself an opportunity to just walk away from all the reading, but I would have to push a button to stop. <laughs> and... Um, and it's an awful lot of reading, as you know, and um, you have to really, you have to imagine what's happening in the context of the trial court because you're just reading it on the page. Um, so that's one difference. And the other difference is when a trial court makes a decision, it just affects the parties in the trial court. But at the Court of Appeals, those decisions become binding precedent on the Court of Appeals and all, all the trial judges. So you have to be really careful about how you write decisions. So uh, I'm assuming you found that your experience as a Superior Court trial judge and having tried cases uh, as a lawyer was of substantial benefit to you when you got to the Court of Appeals? It was very helpful to me. I felt, um, I felt confident when I would review records, like this was not a foreign thing to me just to see what I was reading about. I had been there in those situations before, and that was very, very, very helpful. Um, there are some judges on the Court of Appeals who have no trial court experience. I mean, they'd practice law, but they hadn't been trial judges, and they bring different, different strengths. But a lot of my colleagues would ask me, well, Lucy, you've been a trial court judge. Tell us what you think is going on here. So one of the real benefits of being an appellate judge is you also get two law clerks. And you had previously served as a law clerk uh, for Chief Justice Exum. Uh, what do you look for in law clerks? And what's your process for hiring? Well, what I look for in, in law clerks are um, people who you can get along with because you're going to be working with them that you can get along with. Um, people who really love writing, people who really love writing and who are curious and want to do legal research. But the writing is just so very important to me because appellate judges don't ever see, we don't rarely, we rarely see the public. We don't see jurors. We don't see the parties. And our opinions need to be written in plain language so that regular people can understand not just what the court's ruling was, but how it got there. And so having um, clerks who can write well is really important to me. I review writing samples from clerk from people who apply for clerkships. And I talk 
talk with them about how much do you like to write and and um that is the process i don't give writing tests although that's been recommended to me do, do you uh, do you look for a diversity of candidates over a period of years uh uh, different schools, uh, different backgrounds, different philosophies of the law? I do look, I look for diversity, but I would say um, I look for diversity. It, it happens upon me as people come in. I will say because I went to Carolina, I'm going to get more applicants from Carolina, and I have to work to get applicants from other law schools in North Carolina, Elon, Campbell, Duke, Wake Forest, um, as well as from outside of North Carolina. Um, there is an underrepresentation, at least in my experience at the Court of Appeals, of law clerks who are people of color. And I have made an effort to reach out to Central Law School and to other people I know who may know of candidates of color who might not have applied to my chambers, but I could seek them out. Yeah, I, I can say from my experience that I, I was told by Central grads, North Carolina Central law grads, that um, they just, they didn't apply because they just assumed they wouldn't be given an opportunity to serve as a clerk. And I, I, I would have to say some of the very best clerks I ever had were from uh, were central uh, grads um, and some of the most successful post uh, clerkships. All right. So in 2020, you made the decision that you wanted to go run for the the high court, North Carolina Supreme Court. Uh, you weren't successful in that race, but tell us a little bit about that experience, what you learned from it, and why you decided to saddle up for a second run in 2022? Well, I was not planning um, when we rang in the new year in 2019 to run for the Supreme Court in 2020. Um, but you may recall that I think in February of that year, Chief Justice Mark Martin of the Supreme Court announced that he would be leaving and there was an open seat created. I had just marked my four year anniversary at the Court of Appeals and had no notion of running for the Supreme Court. But when that opening was created, um, people started to ask me if I would be interested. A junior colleague of mine announced that he was going to run for the Supreme Court. And I thought, you know, I have two years left on my term I think I can, I can do that. I can, I can do that job. I think I'd be interested in doing that job. Mm -hmm. And I talked with my husband, Billy, of course, um, because he was going to be affected. And he said, you should do it. You should go for it. And if you are not successful, you can keep work, keep your job at the court of appeals. And um, you can decide two years later, whether you're going to run for reelection or one for the Supreme court again. So I ran, and what I learned in that experience was that unlike in 2014, when I was elected to the Court of Appeals in a nonpartisan race, um, partisan labels on judicial candidates do change the nature of the campaigns. They change the nature of uh, voters' perception of the candidates. And um, it was particularly pronounced because we had a pandemic. And so I was unable to go out and see as many people as I would have liked to. You will remember that even the risk of going out and having contact with people became a partisan polarized issue right. in 2020. Um, I, I, I learned from that experience that, um, you know, I didn't choose to have partisan elections. That's a decision of the legislature. And if we're going to have them, we're going to have to really get out there and work and try, try our best to reach the people, not, not so much the base in either party, but the people who are unaffiliated voters. For the people who might want to know what your experience is and not just look for the D or the R. So 
you had to make a decision. Your term on the Court of Appeals uh, was expiring at the end of 2022. You either had to run for re-election or you had to uh, run again for uh, a seat on the North Carolina Supreme Court. So, uh, Judge Inman, you pushed all the chips in the middle and <laughs> said you're going to run again for the Supreme Court. What, what was the major motivating factor in doing that? Well, I guess a couple of factors, and I really did think long and hard about it. Um, I love my work at the Court of Appeals. It has been the honor of my life to serve there. But I had just run for the Supreme Court. I knew how to do that. I knew what mistakes, um, in retrospect, I thought had been made. Um, and I really really want to serve on our state's court of last resort. The court of appeals is a rule correct, is an error correcting court. We follow the rules. We handle a high volume of cases. The Supreme Court handles a fewer number of cases and they're more complex. But the other thing that really tipped my decision was that changing our judicial elections from nonpartisan to partisan has in my view really diminished the advantage of incumbency. I have seen more turnover in our appellate courts in the last several years since these elections became partisan than I had seen in, in twice the number of years beforehand. And so the advantage of incumbency really is a lot less now. Yeah. All right. Now, my dog is not in the basement. So, uh, <laughs> I have two dogs, actually. Hopefully, uh, the family members, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, they're, they're not helping, are they? Anyway, uh, I, so we'll give it a, a, a five-second pause here for the uh, <laughs> the dog team to stop. Anyway, all right, so your, your opponent is one of your colleagues at the Court of Appeals, Judge uh, Richard Dietz. Um, and it is a partisan election. The Republican ticket has been running as a ticket for well over a year in a very concerted effort to, quote, uh, flip the now four registered Democrats, three registered Republicans to a uh, Republican majority. How do you continue to work in a nonpartisan way and yet have to run a, a statewide campaign in a partisan fashion? Well, um, it's a challenge. It is, yeah. it is, it is, it is difficult. And, um, and it's to me so incongruent with what judges need to do, which is to leave politics at the courthouse steps. Um, but what, and, and I will say the Republican party has been much more organized and disciplined than the Democratic party in running judicial candidates as a slate. That's something that the Democratic party is just trying to, to catch up with. Um, but we're independent judges and, um, it's like trying to herd cats to get Democrats to step in line sometime, um. I think it just makes it more important than ever that each candidate can distinguish themselves from, from the party, from everyone else in the pack. What I do is emphasize my experience as a superior court judge, having been uh, presiding in the trials that we're reviewing at the Court of Appeals and ultimately at the Supreme Court, emphasizing my experience um, all over North Carolina and my background as a newspaper reporter and try to emphasize my skills and my experience that I think will contribute to our state's highest court that are not partisan qualities. Um, now that I believe unaffiliated voters may be the largest voter group in the state, um, it, it really doesn't make sense in my view um, to focus on any one partisan group. The frustrating thing to me is when these graces were nonpartisan, 
a lot more Republicans supported me. When they became partisan, it's like asking somebody to cheat on their spouse. Um, so I'm really focusing on nonpartisan qualifications for the job and trying to distinguish myself in that way. Uh, and of course, one of the challenges of running a statewide race is how do you fund a campaign? You've, you've been pretty successful, as I recall, from the news reports. Uh, how difficult or, or how stressful is it having to raise money to run these campaigns? It's extremely stressful having to raise money. I managed in my whole career as a lawyer um, to to not be the managing partner of a law firm, to not have to um, raise funds. And um, I guess when I first ran for the Court of Appeals, it's how much do you want this job? What are you willing to do within the, within the bounds of what is ethical and what's acceptable under the Code of Judicial Conduct? But the way that I've been able to raise money is to contact people and remember relationships with people. Even when I ran for the Court of Appeals, lawyers who'd been on the other sides of cases um, or people who may not always be happy with the decisions I've written, but who trust me. And the reason that, I, you know, I hate that we have to raise money for these campaigns. We used to have public financing. Right. We used to have public financing. Um, but it's also necessary for any candidate who doesn't just want to be a D or an R to raise the money so that you can control your message and you can have a message that will reach voters. So uh, races for the Supreme Court are drawing extraordinarily greater attention than Court of Appeals races or historically Supreme Court races. And part of it is because of redistricting, Leandro funding, uh, uh, the potential uh, Roe v. Wade type cases coming through the state court system um, after the Dobbs decision. So uh, I, I want you to talk here in our last couple of minutes about the importance of the state constitution sort of how you think about that in the context of interpreting the, the North Carolina Constitution uh, and applying it uh, and its importance in the jurisprudence of the state. Well, the North Carolina Constitution is, is, is fundamental to our justice system. And for many, many decades, it was kind of like that great restaurant that nobody knows about. Um, when I clerked for Chief Justice Exum, he was a scholar of the state constitution. So was Harry Martin, who was on the court at that time. And the reason that there's so much focus on state Supreme Courts is that each state has its own state constitution that, has, that can have provisions that are different than those in the federal constitution. So you mentioned Leandro, and of course, you're very familiar with the uh, the early Leandro decisions, which were based on education clauses in our state constitution. Um, the redistricting case uh, that uh, that most recently has has been handed down by our Supreme Court is based on the free election clause in our state constitution. Um, we also have a provision from the 1868 constitution that in addition to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, every North Carolinian is entitled to enjoy the fruits of their labor. And that was a provision that was written right after the Civil War. And uh, the historical documents suggest it was to make sure that people who had been enslaved knew that they didn't have to work for free and people knew that they had to pay them. Um, but that, that particular provision has been applied in modern times in many different ways. It's what makes North Carolina different than every other state in the union. And here where we elect judges, um, it also, also gives the voters of North Carolina an opportunity to choose who sits on the North Carolina Supreme Court and to judge for themselves who they think is to be trusted with those really, really important decisions. You know. As you know, when it comes to interpreting the North Carolina Constitution, there's no further appeal. 
no further appeal. And that is a tremendous responsibility. So where can interested voters go if they want to find out more about uh, Judge Lucy Inman uh, and her campaign or about her personally? Um, where do they go? Well, I have a website, LucyInmanForJustice.com. Scrolling and across the bottom of the screen. Scrolling story. across the bottom of the screen. Yeah. You can yeah. find me on Facebook, I think, as Judge Lucy Inman. Um, there's also a group called Women for Inman on Facebook. Um, and I'm on Twitter at Judge Lucy Inman and Instagram. And I'll only say that, um, especially on Twitter and Instagram, a lot of the content is not just about the campaign. It's just about my life. It's just about what I'm doing and, and where I'm going. So one, one final question. If, if you are successful, will your husband, Billy Warden, take credit for a brilliant communication strategy that, uh, that pushed you uh, over, the, over the threshold? Well, Billy is my, my always my go-to editor. But he is not my campaign manager, and um, and he he uh, I will say cautions us from things that he he might think are a bad idea. But no, I think he would give credit to a lot of other folks as well as himself. Um, I, I, I'm he's sure got to get some credit. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, I, I always say spouses have the hardest job in a campaign uh, in uh-huh. a lot of ways. So. Yes, um, they do. Yeah. Anyway, uh, Judge Lucy Inman, uh, judge on the North Carolina Court of Appeals, the Democratic nominee for one of two seats on the North Carolina Supreme Court. Thank you so much for talking with us today and uh, giving us a chance to ask you some questions. And we'll look forward to seeing how this race comes out. Best of luck. To thank, you. thank you so very much. And thanks to everybody for viewing and listening. Take care.